Hello, everyone. Greetings from your nation's capital. Uh, I trust you and yours are safe and well during this um, historic time. Uh, we at Denton's here have endeavored over the last, gosh, almost six months now, to provide you with as much intelligence as we possibly can as to how the federal government is responding to both the health crisis and the economic crisis that came from it. Uh, we continue to look ahead into the next months for further uh, help coming directly to our members. Uh, today, however, we're here to talk about elections and a look ahead at November. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do is take a sense of where we are today. And of course, polling will help us tell that story. Then I'll break it down into the Senate, the House, and of course, the main event, the president. We are, uh, as I said, less, less than 80 days out from a, an election. By the time you see this, we'll be even closer. Polls have showed us that there are about 13% of Americans are undecided at the moment. Uh, I happen to believe that number might be a little high, and I believe that because we as Americans, politically speaking, have never been more polarized before. You'll see this in some of the numbers we start to look at. But this polarization, these, this camps, if you will, um, isn't necessarily a new phenomenon. But over the last four years, I think it's very fair to say that the camps have hardened, that those looking to move to the, if you will, the other side are finding harder and harder time to do that. You're also seeing this, believe it or not, in data we see from the Census Bureau about where people are moving to. Americans more and more are moving to areas where they are politically aligned. What does this bode for the, the future of our country? Well, I think to be honest with you, the less uh, intermingling between the two camps uh, that happens, the worse off we are as Americans. So let me start off this presentation with a pitch. Don't let politics of your neighbor or your friend and your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues, what have you. Get in the way of building a friendship. Get in the way of building respect. Get in the way of you reaching out a hand and helping your neighbor, your colleague, your friend. At the end of the day, we are not Republicans or Democrats. We are, in fact, Americans. And to be honest with you, it's about time we started acting like that. Okay, enough of my commercial. Let's go into what the polls are saying today. Let's see the next slide, please. Direction of the country. Well, this should surprise no one. Well, at one surprise here, 25% uh, of people in average, and that's what that top line you see on the screen is, the RPC average. We'll be referring to that a lot in these polling slides. Um, that's a real clear politics average of polls taken so far this month of August. 25% of Americans think the country is going in the right direction. I'd like to know who those 25% of Americans are who believe that while we have had close to 160,000 deaths from the coronavirus, more than 16 million Americans out of work and millions more Americans or million plus Americans who are in fact infected with the disease tend to think the, right, the country is going in the right track. Let's look at the next slide. Job approval. President Trump is averaging about 43%. Believe it or not, that is in and around the range he has been at since well, about two months into his election. That disapproval rating above 50%. That is of concern. Again, we're looking here at the average at the top of the screen. 43% um, approval rating. Can you get reelected with that number? Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, is it tough? <laughs> you better believe it. Let's go to the next slide. Well, here's where we start getting into kind of, I think, what's going to be the, the basis, if you will, of the question of who is going to win the presidency. The public approval of the president's handling of the coronavirus. Again, this goes back a little bit even further into the middle of July. You've got 39.8% of Americans believing he approved or approving of his handling. Over 58% disapproved. Got to tell you, only a few extra points there, if you've noticed, between the overall approval of the president and this coronavirus. Why do I think that the handling of the coronavirus is going to be but one of the, if you will, legs of the stool the president can stand on? 
because this next slide we're going to show you, I think, is what the president was planning to run on all along prior to the um, prior to the coronavirus, and that's the economy. And here at the economy, you see that the president's approval rating on the economy is higher, in fact, than his overall approval rating. The question becomes, is this a coronavirus, uh, coronavirus election or is it an economic election? It's an open question, but I think these are some interesting numbers to look at. Let's dig a little bit deeper here with the next slide. Where, what are people thinking about in the, for the election here? If you notice, 77% have an interest in the 2020 election. That is an historic number, not touched since, if you look in August of 2004, also recall what was happening in August 2004. Iraq was um, in some very bad situation. Uh, a surge was being debated. Um, we were at the precipice, I would say, of a, of a legitimate anti-war movement. That legitimate movement never really caught on fire. But you do have to remember, these are the days when you had, that August of 2004, you had veterans camped outside of George Bush's ranch in Texas. It was, the country was at war, and you had 73%. Today, the country is in an economic meltdown, as a, in dealing with the impacts of a pandemic, and you've got 77% have an interest in the election. Why is that uh, important. That enthusiasm, does the interest actually uh, translate to enthusiasm? Well, you can see the self-reporting number in this, cat, in this chart here, it does fall off. The interest does not necessarily align directly with the turnout. What's going to be different this year is the impact of, I'm going to call them mail-in ballots. Yes, there are different categories here. There's a question of if you get a sent a ballot without ever requesting one. Is it, there's also the category of you've got to request to get a ballot. And there's also the category of you've got to request and have a reason to get a ballot. I think that you're going to see turnout higher because ballots will be, in fact, mailed to Americans without them necessarily having to request it. I'd also argue that the interest in mail-in balloting has been at an all-time high. But what's interesting here is you've got 77% of the Americans have an interest in the election coming. Um, you have the ability not to leave your home and to vote from your kitchen table. How does that, how does that interest turn into um, turnout? Let's go to that next slide. I think it's fair to say Donald Trump won the presidency based on white American votes. Truly, he, he won it based on white Americans without college education votes, and those were in the upper Midwest. I think this is not a surprise to anybody. But what is a surprise here is look at the numbers of the president in July 2020. He's at 48% uh, positive, 46 negative, about 2% difference there. That's in and around. It's a little bit higher than the job approval numbers that we've seen. But slide down the chart there to Joe Biden. He's one up from Hillary Clinton. Joe Biden is, in fact, a known entity. He ain't an outsider. He's been in D.C. Uh, a very, very, very long time. He has near universal name recognition, certainly in this country and abroad. He is not a new entity. I'd be concerned if the Wall Street Journal NBC poll in July of 2020 said that my candidate has a 52% negative rating. It's in and around the numbers that Hillary Clinton had. Uh, we all know how that worked out for Secretary Clinton. So if you want to, if you want to think of it, this is actually one of the bright spots for the president. The fact that Joe Biden, a known entity, will have a hard time recasting himself um, and that that known entity at the moment has a 52% negative um, image rating. Let's look at the next slide. This goes back to the enthusiasm. Now we've seen that about 77% of Americans are very interested in it in this. I'd like you to look at it, this, the candidate matrix here. You say a vote for Trump, for Trump. That basically means you're gonna vote for the president because you like the president. You're, if you look at the next one, you're voting for Biden because you don't like the president. And you move on down, you're voting for Biden for Biden, you're voting for Trump and not Biden. Here's what I'm really concerned about. Again, if I am running the Biden campaign, only 18%, according to this, according to the Wall Street Journal NBC poll, are voting for Biden for Biden. 
They're voting for him because they like him, because they believe in him, because they want him. You've got more people voting for Biden just not to be Trump. So clearly this campaign is about President Trump. But the enthusiasm that you see on the president's side, going back to, again, remember the two camps that I talked about. Our camp is, is if you will, the Republican camp is solidly behind the president in numbers like you have not seen before since Reagan's reelection in 84. This again is something that the president can in fact and must exploit if he wants to get to the White House. His support, he has to turn out his supporters. He has to turn out every single one of them. And certainly in states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. All right, let's go to the next slide. I did this because I wanted to take a look at kind of, well, where do we stand today? And how can we compare that to 16? And again, on this one, I'd ask you to go down to the bottom box here, the average box. And what you see here, what's interesting is again, the president's proven rating amongst his, amongst his Republican base, much stronger than it was in 16. Biden's numbers seem a little bit better than Hillary Clinton's numbers were in 16. But again, I don't know if you can call this a jump ball, a 40, 44, 52, it's, that's, that's still pretty tough numbers to come back from. That said, you go through the, the question of enthusiasm and the questions of attention, and those tend to, and the, the if you will, the image rating of both candidates. Uh, one, President Trump is a little bit closer than the 44 number that we're seeing here. All right, let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about the House of Representatives. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Democrats uh, will in fact hold on to their majority given where we are today. Let's take a look at the next slide. Again, pretty basic breakout is what you see. You got 198 Republicans, 232. As we all know from our civics classes, you only need 218 to run the show. The Democrats run the show. The reality of the situation is while there are roughly 24 seats held by Democrats that the president has won, that the one in 2016, there's been a failure on the Republican side to, to in fact, recruit candidates that would appeal to the middle. They have been able to get the far, I won't call them fringes, instead I will call them the far side of the, the political spectrum candidates in these districts. And I got to tell you, that district does not align with that type of candidate. Let's go to the next slide here. Can you take a look, and I apologize that the, the, um, that the type is a little light here, but take a look, and this is where you're seeing the races. And if you look, I'm talking about here at the Democratic toss-up. It's the gray boxes. There are two of them in the middle. One's Republican, one's Democrat. And you've got about 15 Democrats in those toss-up seats. And again, looking at those seats, those are Trump districts for some respects. Some are freshmen. I'm looking down here at Virginia 7. That, of course, is not a Trump district. Uh, the president on the ballot helped push out the Republican that was sitting there. You look again at... Um, Minnesota 7, Peterson. Minnesota has been interesting, and Peterson is one of the sole Democrats that can still hold on to a rural, if you will, Trump district. That's one of the seats I'm looking at here. He wasn't able to flip Peterson out when he was on the ballot in 16. I don't think he's going to do it here again. But then you start looking over at the California seat. You look at the Republican seats in Arizona, in California, in Illinois, in Texas. I'm not a believer at the moment that Texas is ready to flip to blue, nor am I a believer that Texas is in fact a purple state. We have been fed that line for the last three or four cycles. It just hasn't hit yet. Yes, you can make an argument that demographics are in fact destiny. However, I'd argue that the destiny just ain't ready there yet. But this is where you're seeing the races. If you are in these districts around the country, you are going to be blessed, blessed I say, to be trapped at home and 
stuck watching TV with more campaign commercials than you will ever, ever, ever want to see. A steady diet of dark screens and shady screens and ominous voices are coming your way. I hope you enjoy it or have the ability to flip past commercials. Um, or they haven't figured out a way to get commercials on Netflix yet, to my knowledge, so maybe it's best to stay on Netflix for the next couple of months. Let's take a look at the next slide. I think this is important. We actually had to update this uh, today, yesterday, because of an election that happened in Florida on Tuesday. You've got eight House incumbents that have lost so far this year. Believe it or not, this is historic. Incumbents, as we all know, tend to get through the primary at the very least and tend to get reelected more often than not. I believe the numbers are in the low 90% of incumbents getting reelected. To lose eight, both Republicans and Democrats, for a variety of different reasons is of note. And then let's think about those variety of different reasons through the gaze of 77% of Americans are interested in election this November. Now, is that to say they were interested in the primaries as well? No. However, I think the increased interest here in this election has found its way into the primary because you're seeing guys like Dan Lipinski. Dan Lipinski was been, is an institution in Illinois. He is actually the last, I believe, pro-life Democrat. He is a, it's, uh, it's Chicago and suburban Chicago district. He lost to a progressive Democratic candidate. Steve King from Iowa. If you, uh, Steve King has been basically um, kicked out of the Republican conference here. He has, he made some, uh, I'll say it, some outlandishly racist comments about fellow Americans that um, there was no way to defend. Um, he was taken out. You know, he was taken out for something that he had done. And of these group, of this group, I would say he had the highest profile. But you start looking around at Elliot Engel in New York, beaten by a progressive. Scott Tipton in Colorado, here beaten by a more conservative. Uh, Steve Watkins, Steve Watkins in Kansas, well, he might have committed voter fraud, and that got uh, announced, or the charges got announced about two days before the election. Uh, Lacey Clay, here again, a longtime serving member of the uh, Congressional Black Caucus, lost to a more progressive member in Cori Bush. And Ross Spanos, who has some, had his own ethical issues, losing to Scott Franklin. Why have I put this up? Well, because these members either got beaten by a progressive or had their own issues, which prevented them from, or own issues, read legal issues, um, that were enough for, if you will, the base to turn them away. But it was the base plus. This doesn't really happen. Generally, you get the pass, right? That Ross Spanos district in Florida, that's a Republican district. That ain't going to change. The Lacey Clay district in Missouri, that's a Democratic district. That's not going to change. Um, but those, those people, those Democrats, those Republicans, those bases in those districts wanted a new member. Why do I flag this? Because it could be a little bit of a foretelling of a throw the bums out. It's interesting, I was on a call with some of your members earlier today where we talked about Congress's inability to get a phase four package done before they left for the August recess. And could this have an impact on uh, elections in November? I think it can. And I think that we're about maybe another bullet point or two away from actually having this shift to incumbents in trouble across the country. Let's go to the next slide. The Senate. The Senate has been the bastion of Republicans and Mitch McConnell. It has been a, uh, an effective, um, shall we say, implementer of the president's judicial agenda. And that was, of course, let's fill all the vacancies you possibly can as quickly as you possibly can. And Mitch McConnell has set an historic pace. And he has changed the look, not just of the Supreme Court, but the federal judiciary all the way down the line. This will be the lasting impact of the Congress, of the 2018 to 2020 Congress. It will not be the COVID bills. It will in fact be the, the reshuffling, if you will, of the federal judiciary. But let's talk about the campaign. Next slide, please. So as we look at this, Democrats don't have very far to go. 
you win the majority, you win the presidency, you need three seats. You don't get the presidency, you need four. Recall, of course, the vice president serves as the president of the Senate and can vote, which is why you win the presidency, you only need three to pick up that majority. Of course, 2008 was a, um, with Barack Obama on the ballot, helped, uh, well, really, Barack Obama on the ballot and George Bush in the in the rearview mirror helped take out five GOP incumbents. Uh, we've had four retirements this year around, three on the Democrat Republican side, one on the Democratic side. Most of those seats, let's be honest, there was something interesting going on in Kansas. Uh, in the primary, that has gone away. You're not going to flip the NZ seat, and nor are you going to flip Tennessee. I, I want to point out something that um, George is going to get a lot of discussion here, but I want to say uh, that Johnny Isaacson, who has retired for health reasons, um, is the type of, from Georgia, is the type of senator and the type of legislator and the type of human being that we really need as Americans to put into the United States Senate and the House of Representatives. And I say that because he was a man, he is a man, excuse me, who uh, is knowledgeable of the process, one of the best process guys in town, but also one of the friendliest members of the United States Senate, who was willing to work with his friends on the other side of the aisle, was willing to, if you will, not be the first guy to talk at a press conference to get something done. Johnny Isaacson will be missed. His legacy at the moment is being held by Kelly Loeffler. Uh, Kelly Loeffler will have a, a special election on election day uh, where she will be facing both a Republican challenger as well as a Democratic challenger. That's gonna be tough for the Republicans. Let's flip to the next slide. Here we are. This is where the, this is where the races are. As you can see, um, it's, it's spread out across the country. Let's flip to the next slide. Actually, I'd like to go two slides up before I go uh, into the next map. Thank you. There we go. All righty, so let's look at the yellow. Those are the toss-up races. You got Cory Gardner running against John Hickenlooper in Colorado. Uh, I had a Democratic, uh, excuse me, a Republican political consultant in Colorado talk to me uh, yesterday um, saying that while Cory Gardner did get his large, one of the largest uh, land conservation pieces of legislation done in the last 35 years, um, which matters a whole heck of a lot to Colorado, while he was able to get that done, the line was not even Lazarus can come back with the numbers he's got. That's, that's tough. If you look down at the Arizona, you'll notice that's a, uh, a lean, I would say that's a solid Democratic seat now. Why do I say that? Well, Martha McSally, who's the Republican in that seat, you recall she, she was appointed to the seat. She lost her election in 2016, excuse me, in 2018 to Kristen Sinema. She was appointed to the open seat from John McCain. Uh, she is running against uh, Mark Kelly, an astronaut with no record. Well, I, I just gotta say, it's real tough to hold on to a seat when you're the incumbent, when you didn't win it the first time, but instead were appointed, and you're running against a guy whose wife tragically was a member of Congress and shot uh, while doing constituent service work in a parking lot in Arizona in her district uh, and went through a um, very substantial recovery but, of course, but has been unable to, because of her wounds, uh, get back to where she was before the shooting, garnering significant amount of goodwill for her across the state. But let's be honest, it's Rocket Man you're running against. Everybody loves astronauts. Everybody. Uh, even if it's Elon Musk and they seem to be sitting in a touch, a touch screen a tube these days. Um, and we got, just a quick little side note, we got really excited a couple weeks ago about um, a capsule coming back to Earth with parachutes and landing in the water. Um, weren't we doing that in the 60s? Anyway, sorry, quick little aside, but let's keep going looking at these yellows. You've got North Carolina, Tom Tillis. Listen, I think President Trump actually holds on to North Carolina this time. And I do think that Tom Tillis is able to get through on his coattails. In Georgia, we talked about the Kelly Loeffler. The other seat there is um, 
It's actually this man right here, if you can see him, David Perdue, uh, Mr. Perdue, a Trump before Trump, but without the edge, a businessman who had done lots of international manufacturing and the like, uh, has done a pretty well. I will say he is not necessarily offensive to white women in the suburbs. You're going to hear that a lot, white women in the suburbs. They really will decide this time. Um, and he's facing a, a younger candidate by the name of Joel Olsoff, who ran in and lost the most expensive special election, uh, gosh, of the last, actually the most expensive special election. Um, I think that Purdue there slides through, gets it done. Again, Loeffler is going to be a different question. And then if you move all the way up to Maine, can Susan Collins hang on again? You know, um, that's an open question. She's running against the... Uh, the Speaker of the Maine House. Uh, she also has pretty much near universal name recognition, as does Susan Collins. The, there will not be a want for resources on any side. Uh, and that's going to be a just a knockdown, drag out fight. But the race for the Senate, if you're looking at it, and Montana, you'll notice Montana, it's a little less of a bright yellow here in this graph. Um, I'm not really ready to say it's a toss-up yet. I do think it leans Republican. I do think the president will win Montana, and I think that will help Steve Daines. However, he is running against former Governor Bullock, who also ran for president uh, early on in the Democratic primary. Uh, both members have, or both men have, both have near universal name recognition, and that's going to be a shootout. Uh, but I still think today it's leaning a little bit still to the Republican and Mr. Daines. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Before we dig deep into the White House numbers, I want to I want to offer you this. As you've heard me say before, I believe Donald Trump did not win the 2016 election. I believe Hillary Clinton lost it. I believe Hillary Clinton's decisions not to, in the final weeks of the campaign, not to campaign in rural Pennsylvania, not to go to Wisconsin, and to ignore rural Michigan had a significant impact on her ability to win the White House. I also believe that while Hillary, uh, Secretary Clinton might have been a fantastic executive, certainly she had the experience, both the internal politics, if you will, of life in the White House, but also as Secretary of State and the Senator from New York. Um, her campaign and she were terrible. They missed it. They got the wrong numbers. They didn't read. They didn't see the uh, the dramatic split between rural America and urban America. They counted on rural Democratic votes sticking with them. Well, about forty thousand of them didn't uh, in places like uh, Wisconsin, uh, and that changed changed the output changed the uh, changed history because it put Donald Trump in the White House. So it's important to understand. That's why I've thrown this here. Joe Biden isn't Hillary Clinton. Now the negatives might be in a close. Hillary Clinton's Hillary's negatives are certainly higher, but Joe Biden is a different candidate. Uh, and can Joe Biden appeal to remember he's the man from Scranton, although he lives in Delaware, but we're gonna hear a lot about the man from Scranton. Can he appeal to these rural, white, non-college educated voters? That's really the question. All right, let's flip to the next slide. Some dates. Hey, guess what? <laughs> People start voting on the 19th of September. Uh, 38 states in all do allow early voting. They have different start times and different finish times, but Americans are going to be voting. Um, I think first early voting starts with three and off the top of my head, I can't pull who those three are. Before you'll notice 10 full days before a debate has happened. Does this, does this mean the impact of debates are not going to be as substantial? I don't know. I would think that these debates are going to matter a whole heck of a lot. Let's go down to the next slide. All right, so this is where it's coming down to in my very, very humble opinion. Florida, Michigan, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina. Let's be honest, picking up any more votes in California for a Democratic candidate don't matter. Same is true in uh, for New York. Um, this is where the rubber meets the road. And what's, what's true about all of these states is you do have significant rural populations. These significant rural populations that felt they had been left behind by the eight years of the Obama administration. Through these rural populations that didn't believe Hillary Clinton shared their values. Well, even with that, let's look at it here. 
Donald Trump won with 1.2, one Florida, 1.2%. Where is it today? This is again, the real clear politics numbers. Biden's up six points in polls. Michigan, 0.2%. Biden's up five points. 0.2% is roughly 37,000 votes, roughly. Minnesota, Clinton won that by 1.5%. Biden's up three. Pennsylvania, 0.7%. Biden's up four. Wisconsin, here again, Trump with a 0.7, Biden up four. Arizona, 3.5. Well, that's kind of substantial here. Polling, Biden up one. Georgia, Trump plus five. You see this hit. This hits what's scaring the Loeffler folks. Trump's now at plus two. North Carolina, Trump won it with 3.6%. This poll says, at least the average of polls has Biden plus one. Let's be honest, that's the margin of error. What's the point of this slide? The point of this slide is to reinforce to everyone here that Donald Trump did not win with a landslide. As we know, he did not win the popular vote. He eked out wins in the upper Midwest. If you can consider Pennsylvania upper Midwest, okay, I'll give it to you. But remember, other than Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh, that some people like to believe Pennsylvania is Alabama. Just a little joke there. Uh, remember, I spent four years in Ohio, so I'm allowed to. Uh, Wisconsin. Then you get down into the West with Arizona and Georgia. I'm just not ready to say Georgia is changing yet. North Carolina is a battle. But let's look at these upper Midwestern states because that's where it's that's what it is. That's where it's coming down to. Those are the voters that both Donald Trump and Joe Biden are going after. And I would argue that those are the voters that are more receptive to a Joe Biden candidacy, even with Kamala Harris on the ticket, than they necessarily were to a Hillary Clinton and uh, Tim Kaine ticket. Let's go to the next slide. So here it is, much like what you saw with the Senate and the turnout, this is where we're looking. You know, Colorado, are you thinking about that race in Colorado? Well, all right, that's pretty blue. Is Are we gonna have some ticket switchers there? That's, I don't think Americans today with uh, where we are in the polarization, which I talked about, are ticket switching anymore. I'd be surprised, it'd be nice. But I think Cory Gardner is going to need someone to, you know, need some ticket switching for him to get over. And I just don't see that happening, which is why that, which is why the map looks like that it does. Again, asking, looking you to look at those toss up races. Remember, it's 270 to win. This map has Donald Trump at, or excuse me, this map has the Democratic ticket um, at 268. So he needs to pick up two. You can get to two pretty quickly with an Arizona win, a Wisconsin win a Florida win. Again, I don't think North Carolina happens, but you can see that just where the map stands today, Donald Trump at 204 votes needs to pick up significantly more and needs to flip some of these blue back to his column. He's got a lot of work to do. All right, let's flip to the next slide. Again, just reiterating, this is where it comes down to, guys. You want to look in that toss-up, the lean Democrat, lean Republican. If you are in those states, uh, much like the uh, maybe turn off your television or just watch the Netflix because you are going to be inundated with ads. All right, let's go to the next one. So this is what I'd like you to think about as we look and try and prognosticate into what's going to happen in 2020. And there are five questions here. And, you know, these are the questions, believe it or not, that I stare at the ceiling at night and try and answer in my head so I can provide some bit of, of clarity to what is an incredibly murky situation. But let's ask the questions. Has the president expanded his base? I think he's gotten more than picked up three percentage points in Michigan picked up, three percentage points in Pennsylvania. What actions has he taken and has been successful in to expand its base? I will make an argument that in fact, the Trump presidency has not been about expanding his base, but instead invigorating his existing one and speaking only to them. I think that that has a significant downside for a candidate who was elected without winning the popular vote and was, was elected without significant wins in the upper Midwest. I'll take a win, right? 50 plus one is a win, but 0.7% isn't enough to just take your own base for granted. 
as the urban and versus rural divide grown since 2016. Uh, a quick aside, other than a bunch of urban folks trying to get the heck out of their cities and going to uh, rural areas during the time of COVID, I think that in fact you have seen a continued growth here in this divide. I think it has to do with education. I think it has to do with economy. Uh, I think it has to do with the uh, jobs that are available in the rural, uh, in rural parts of this country. And I do not think that in the last, in this summer of, of real turbulence, and I think that's really what we can call it here following the George Floyd murder, um, that we have, that those looking at those urbanites looking rural or those ruralites looking in urban see much in common with each other. This third question, the coronavirus versus the economy. And that's what, it, at its most basic level, that's what it comes down to. Do you blame President Donald Trump for where we are today in the coronavirus? And does that blame outweigh the economy that he had going into February? And does that outweigh the efforts he's taking now to get the economy back up and running? I think that's the question of this, this entire election. It's coronavirus versus economy. Who do you blame? Uh, and yes, blaming the Chinese uh, might be nice, but that don't help you on election day. All right, this, this does a little bit, this fourth question here, the rule of law versus the fight for equality. This is what I've tried to frame um, our summer of protests, protests which are continuing to this day. Uh, there will be more marches on Washington as we, uh, as we progress through the summer. You continue to see Portland, which let's be honest, is Portland um, it, on fire. I think last night they, uh, or, I'm sorry, we were taping this a little bit earlier, but Portland continues to be on fire. But what I've tried to do here is frame rule of law as being not necessarily those that, uh, and so let me be very clear, rule of law does not mean you support police abuse very clearly. However, you want a strong police force and you don't believe the police should be defunded. First, the fight for equality. And I would argue that then the fight for equality, yes, there are folks that don't want to see the, the, the defunded police. However, also don't want to see any more um, seven and a half minute videos of police officers on the neck of African-American men, all the while asking for help because he can't breathe. I think this is very important because this is where you will find white women in the suburbs. This is a question that the president has certainly embraced as saying that as a rule of law, president, I'm going to appeal to you, white suburbanite woman. I think there's others that have said that the fight for equality also appeals to the white suburban woman. What's important to remember here, or not necessarily remember, but to reflect on, is the tremendous social change that has happened over the last 10 years with the question of the, uh, marriage equality. I can remember being, on the, being in the speaker's office working with the Clinton administration to pass the Defense of Marriage Act. And you think of how quickly that has swung. And it swung quickly because of, uh, I will argue, because of the changes of um, changes in white suburban women, as well as African, African American urban women. That's where the change was, and that's, where, that's what led to the changes we see today. I think it's a, it's a tough question. As I said, I frame this as navel gazing, so we can spend a lot of time navel gazing about it and how you define the terms, but the question really is, is are the, the, the unrest you're seeing in cities across America where they're calling for social justice? Does that play as a social justice call or does that play as a rule of law call? And I think that's an open question. And then finally, the argument that I make for, that all elections are based on, and that is, are you better off today than you were four years ago? I think at the top line, all of us can say, well, we're still healthy, knock on wood, bite our tongue. But the economy is in shambles and 167, 160 plus thousand Americans have died. How in fact do you answer that you are better off today than you were four years ago? Well, I think that's going to be the question that um, the question that will be asked and answered on election day. Will you know the results the day after the election? Probably not.
it's going to take a little while given the amount of absentee ballots and the rest will that give the opportunity for uh, the perception of tomfoolery and shenanigans absolutely uh, quick little inside joke, guess what? Tomfoolery and shenanigans happen in every election at every level every year. It's not new. Ballot harvesting is something you're going to hear a lot about over the next couple of weeks and months. Um, ballot harvesting, again, not new. Happens all the time. So you, you heard that term here first for me. You're going to hear a lot more as we go further. So I think that's where we stand today. We have an America that is decided to align themselves in one of two camps, so much so that they have actually started to live in those camps. You have a Democratic nominee with near universal name recognition who has some pretty high negatives. Now, not so high as the last Democratic nominee, but high nonetheless. You've got a president who has not uh, changed his style, shall we say, not tacked to the middle at all, who has some pretty, uh, you know, not necessarily great job approval numbers, not necessarily great numbers on handling the coronavirus, but decent numbers handling the, the uh, economy. Not Again, not great, but better than anything else. And you've got the highest level of Americans paying attention to this campaign we've had in the last 20 years. It's going to be a rip-roaring election night. I think it's going to be uh, a close night, certainly given today. I think debates will matter, even with Americans voting before. I'd argue that those voting before are the bases of both parties, not necessarily those that are undecided. And you're hoping that Americans do, in fact, take advantage of the ability to vote remotely and exercise their franchise, because at the end of the day, our turnout is abysmal for what we claim to be to the world as a beacon of democracy, the fact that we as Americans don't participate in that democracy in overwhelming numbers is a knock on us. And I'd argue will be, uh, unless quickly addressed, will have significant repercussions moving ahead. Okay, um, thank you all for having me. I've got some questions. And uh, why don't I start with those? John, who do you think will win the presidential election? Once you tell us, we know, we will know to expect the opposite. Well, that's just not nice. And yes, okay, fairly, fairly, fairly. I did say Hillary Clinton would win. Uh, but for the record, I did say Mitt Romney wouldn't. And I did say John McCain wouldn't. So, you know, hey, I'm not, I'm not batting that badly. Um, I got to put all my chips on the table and put it in and put the, put the, uh, put the, um, put my marker in now on the 20th of August, Joe Biden wins. Democrats have 51 seats in the United States Senate uh, and the House majority grows by three or four seats for the Democrats, but basically means Pennsylvania Avenue, both ends from the White House to the Capitol building are controlled by Democrats. Now you've got me on tape. Uh, so uh, you can bring this up over and over and over again, should I be wrong. But again, I, I frame this, I try not make it that hard and frame it simply as, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Uh, I think it's hard to make the argument that you're better off four years, that you're better off today than you were four years ago. Uh, all right. How and why did the U.S. Mint fail to perform the critical function of keeping the quarter in readily available circulation? because we weren't prepared for a pandemic. Because while, it ex while a game plan existed, um, put together by Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, Department of Tr Treasury, HHS, CDC, among others, that plan, which actually foresaw currency issues, was thrown out. It was not pulled off the shelf. It was not put into use. Questions like this, uh, were not considered by the administration because they were caught flat-footed. That's how I believe. That's what I believe happened. Uh, I believe this is um, this is pure incompetence because they were unable to. Uh, they didn't have a plan ready to go. They hadn't thought through this. They didn't use the plan that existed that had questions like this answered. That had steps taken 
to ensure not just the coinage, but let's talk about gas and oil um, and transportation in general. I do not believe this administration ever felt that they were going to find themselves in a situation where the states of Maryland, uh, Virginia, the District of Columbia shut down. Colorado as well, where they couldn't get their employees into the mint to print the coins. This is a byproduct of an administration that was hoping, uh, I think, and as we've seen, uh, unfortunately, um, Pollyanna -ish, Pollyanna Ishley, that this would go away, that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic would not have a significant impact. It certainly did, and they were caught flat-footed. And that's why we have a situation now where if you walk into, and certainly in Washington, D.C., if you walk into the market or the convenience store of some kind, they will ask you to pay with plastic because they do not have change. Uh, recently, POTUS has made, President of the United States, pretty strong use of the acronym there, has made statements concerning the upcoming election from already calling the potential results fraudulent or not accepting, quote unquote, a loss result if it comes. How do you think this scenario plays out if Trump loses? Donald Trump claims to be a law and order guy. Uh, I don't know of any more um, sacrosanct law than the peaceful or order if you will, then the peaceful transition of power. I think there will be those uh, on his, uh, on the right side of his flank that will be calling any, um, any result illegitimate that doesn't have him winning. However, um, we've seen a lot of strange and um, <laughs> interesting, uh, I guess it goes back to the Chinese proverb of may you live in interesting times, which we all know is more of a bless, more of a curse than a blessing. We've seen some interesting behavior out of the Oval Office over these last three plus years. However, I think that the president not leaving the office after having votes certified, and remember they must be certified, the Electoral College must be certified by the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, should the president disregard that certification, uh, you will have a, an uproar amongst Republicans and Democrats, and the president will, in fact, uh, be, not be in office on January 7th, 8th, something like that, whenever, uh, whenever swearing-in day is. Let's see, what other questions we have here? What are the three most important goals that the AMA has that government could help or hinder? Well, I think we've seen it. And the most important goal is that government must provide, in fact, steady, um, planable, if you will, um, responses. The fact that the PPP program has been allowed to lapse, the fact that there has been so many questions around forgiveness uh, of these PPP loans, the fact that, um, in fact, Congress has left without finishing up and, and doing a phase four bill, I think all lend themselves to the AMA and its membership have to be involved in the process, have to be talking to the members, have to be putting a face to the impacts of the actions that the Congress and the administration are taking. I look forward to being able to do that with, uh, with you in September as we plan some virtual trips to Washington. No, you will not have to get on a plane, nor will you have to get uh, a hotel room for the night. Instead, you can sit in your comfortable office chair and uh, we hope be beamed into a handful of congressional offices to talk about the impacts of the government actions and the failure to in fact act on you and your businesses and your communities. That is what, what we as an association do best. We drive home, not what it is for AT&T, not what it is for Google, not what it is for Morgan Stanley. We drive home what it is for small businesses that keep this country running. It's a, um, a challenge, as we all know, to punch through the usual noise and morass that is the swamp here in Washington. But it is our challenge and one that we've accepted to, in fact, as I said, give a face to the struggles of small businesses in our current environment. We can't expect change until we in fact engage. We've engaged, we will continue to engage. Again, I thank you very, very much for having me today. Uh, I miss not being in person with you. More than you know, I'll miss not being able to spend a little time uh, with the products in the shows. Uh, I hope that uh, this time next year, I am 
sitting together with you um, in Illinois. And uh, we are talking about the impacts, the positive impacts that Congress has been able to um, affect for us, and our businesses, and our families, and the country as a whole. With that, be safe, stay well, get your absentee ballot, or get ready to get in line and vote, and participate. We as Americans should demand it.